I could go off the deep end I could kill all my best friends I could follow those stylish trends And God knows I could make amends But I've got an angry heart Filled with cancers and poppy tarts If this is how you folks make art It's fucking depressing I will say the cage match with Austin St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But that's asking so little. It is. I, no, I, it's very smoke and mirrors. And, and he I, takes a big, like, New Jack bump to sell the match. And I, I made the point before with Austin is that he's the prime example of the most perfectly pushed mid-carder. So much so that people don't understand that he really was a very middle-of-the-road, average mid-card wrestler. Even his promos. Go back and watch his WCW stuff. You take out the swearing, he's got nothing. He was the epit- he was the king of cheap pops. That's all he had. He swore, talked about beer, talked about whipping ass. Like it was all the, it was all the chinsiest, cheesiest catchphrases you'd see on a gas station bumper sticker. Which was '90s pop culture. Which was '90s pop. Oh yeah, no. '90s pop culture to a hilt was Jerry Springer on pay per view showing titties and Budweiser commercials. Oh god, even the uh, even on into the early 2000s, it was still. Go- I mean, remember the. Uh, the Paris Hilton era? Paris Hilton era. You had like... I mean, I, I made the point. Someone asked me about the uh, the Walmart wrestler guys. I think Marvin uh-huh. Brace broke his back. Yeah, taking a spine buster under the corner of an air hockey table. Which is why I never co-sign the guys that do this stuff. Because whenever people are like, oh, but they're really athletic. Yeah, and I hope that they take that they use this attention to get to some get training. trained. Yeah, yes. Like, because the best examples of backyard wrestling is M-Dog 20 and uh, Matt Cross mm-hmm. and Josh Prohibition. And that was what they did. They sold all their footage of them doing backyard stuff, and they used that money to go to wrestling <laughs> Sold school. their likeness for a video game, and then went to a wrestling school. Mm-hmm. They went to, uh, what was his name, school in Ohio. I couldn't even tell you the guy's name. Um, but yeah, no, they started, because I talked to M-Dog about it. He started around the same time in the same class as Ray Rowe as well. Yeah. Like They were all in the same opening class. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's one thing that I think that you would be very adapt with is you came up in this would you call it the socal scene or what would you what would well, you no, call? i came up in norcal i came up right at the, I, I what i call us is we are the uh, beyond the mat generation yeah because we were all the guys that after beyond the mat hit big we were the ones that all signed up at apw because it was the first time a lot of us had heard i mean unless you grew up in the northeast and you saw a lot of those uh the old you know whatever nbc nightly news the stories. german that murders and oki just happened which is hilarious because you can also see Inoki's ear, and you realize that German really didn't hurt him at all. You no. see, just you just see how cauliflower his ears are, and you know that man cannot be hurt. Yeah, we, we uh, for background, not even noise because we're both ADD as, as all hell. We just have uh, an old school Japanese tape playing, and we've got Vader versus Inoki from the Tokyo Dome, not the infamous match that got New Japan kicked off of network television and sent Japanese pro wrestling to the dark ages for a couple of years. This is the follow up at the Tokyo Dome, Wait, which was what almost ten years later. Yeah, because yeah, it was not because it was 80, 86, 87? 86, so. when it was big. Sl- it wasn't big slam Vader. What was the name that they brought him in under? God, what was the, it? Because the debut name for Vader was something a little bit different. Oh, that, big Bam Bader. Oh, okay. No, that, well, here's the deal: is that um, the Japanese don't have a V in their language. Yeah, so it was Big Bam Bader. So it may have actually still technically been Big Van Vader. Yeah, but it, it's kind of like how with uh, Ibushi. When he initially started getting big in the U.S. around 07, 08, people were calling him Kota, were calling him uh, Ibushi Kota. They yeah. Re- for whatever reason, everyone, every other wrestler, you knew that the Japanese had a family name first and then the, the given name. But for some reason, he was the one no one put together. That's what they were doing, and that Kota is actually his first name. God bless Kota Ibushi. I've actually worked for the promoter that he did the fireworks spot for. In oh, England. in the U.K.? Yeah, uh, Dan and Emily uh, yeah. Reed. They, oh, because one... Emily Reed runs uh, Eve, doesn't she? Not anymore. She? Not anymore. Oh, so this is the one of the few times I've actually been very angry about something in wrestling. I'll just throw this in here because why not? Basically, uh, Emily is hands down the most queer positive and inclusive promoter I have ever seen. Like, she legitimately takes this stuff to heart mm. and really does care about having inclusive language and not. I mean, I mean, she actually made a T-shirt because she's British. It said it was for pro wrestling shirt. It said "Tough Titties, Hard Cunt," and several of her trans fans were bothered by that and they brought it up to her and she was like okay I understand That's and she took the shirt down because she's like yeah it's not my goal to offend anyone it's not my goal to I mean she's like I want to be an inclusive support- community an inclusive yeah. community and supportive and let trans fans know they're not only accepted but they're welcomed here mm-hmm. what wound up happening was um, I guess Eve was going to promote a show 
where it was uh, women and non-binary people only in the audience. I remember hearing about that. And basically, there was this huge shitstorm because they, uh, some members of the of the LGBT wrestling community felt her language on that poster was not inclusive enough. I've never met her. She is a sweetheart. She, she seems the- like a sweetheart. And that concept isn't a new one. If you go back to Kathleen Hanna, back in the day, Olympia Washington, Girls in the Front, the Bikini Kill movement that she was doing, where the whole idea was to make the punk rock scene and the grunge scene more inclusive and safe for women that wanted to be a part of it, mm-hmm. that's a concept that is rang- that is rung true through multiple generations across multiple countries. The idea that Eve would try and make progress with that is great. And, you know, in general, I feel like it's a positive motion that she was trying to put forward. Oh, it absolutely was. And she, they've done it before. But again, it was this weird thing where because she cares, the people that were upset and accusing her of being a turf, which is like... Trans-exclusionary radical feminist. It's the basically the way Americans think of the word cunt is the way the British see the word turf. Yeah. It's that offensive. Mm. Like, it, for her, it was very hurtful to be called a turf and to be accused of that because it's something she's genuinely against. Mm-hmm. And not in the sense of she's trying to market a product in the sense of that's really how she feels. That yeah. is her actual personality. But the problem is, because she's actually sensitive to these issues and she really does care when people are accusing her of these things, it actually does affect her. And it, she finally, and she got to the point where she felt it was too much of a negative her, if her presence on Eve was a negative impact she did not want to be present there and cause harm to the company and to the women who work there and it, it's a really sad story because yeah. again if she was apathetic if she didn't care if it was just a marketing ploy she could just shrug it off but because she actually cares she can't shrug it off she it really did hurt her and she decided that that was what was best for and other people had come in and to help with Eve so it wasn't just her and Dan anymore mm-hmm it's just it's a it's a tragic thing to happen when someone really does care and really does try and, and it, puts that much of themselves into a product and their reward for it is the very people they're trying to help pushing them out because this one time it wasn't good enough even if you were willing to make it that way when it was brought to your attention that it wasn't good enough and I think that gets onto the topic of I mean pro wrestling is not just now, but I mean, for a couple of years now, I've been grappling with its relationship with quote unquote cancel culture. Oh, yeah. And obviously, many wrestlers. I, I recently had a conversation with Jason Cade. He was talking about a similar thing where he said that he, in general, is a very sarcastic individual. He mm-hmm. likes to talk shit. He will talk shit online with his friends. The problem is, if he does it in the public forum, it can very easily be misconstrued by a fan as something that it's not or something that's intended to be more hurt, more hurtful than it actually is being said in execution. Well, one of the issues is that when you say it publicly, it becomes what might be an internal thought now now becomes policy. Yeah. So even if you can look at something and say, I disagree with this, I think it's silly, I think it's stupid, I don't think it's important, and you can feel that way. But the second you say it publicly, the second you put your stamp on it and say, I have to tweet this out, I have to put this on Instagram, I have to do whatever, you've now made it a policy. You've now put it in writing, this is what I believe. And for the most part, a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. And that's the really weird thing, is that people will take these these hard stances on things that genuinely don't affect them. I, I don't get why they do it, but I, sometimes I think it's the high of feeling, you know... A part of a community. The, the, of, the, yeah. the, the, the mob mentality, I mean, I, granted, I know that, that that term has been co-opted by some people to try and defend really shitty actions. Well, but, have I ever told you my whole thing about the, the two sides to every story? Go for it. So I, I threw this out there the other day to a friend of mine. He appreciated it. He's a teacher. But I said, the, the problem with two sides to every story is that, number one, there aren't actually two sides to every story. There's details. That's what there really is. But moreover, it only ever seems to come up nowadays when you're trying to defend someone who's really shitty as though it's a magic spell that declares our whole discussion a, uh, a stalemate. Mm-hmm. The both sides-isms. I mean, obviously, yeah. it came to a huge front with... Uh can't even think of the name of the town where it happened with the whole Nazis marching in the street a few years ago. I've always said that it's okay to censor Nazis for one very key reason. Their platform has not changed in 70 years. There's nothing new they're bringing to the table. We don't need to listen. Yeah. When, when you say, we're all for white supremacy and clean energy. Okay, now we have to listen for at least a second here with the clean energy thing is. And if your clean energy is burning people alive, we know we don't need to listen anymore. <laughs> but enough about Elon Musk. <laughs> oh, that's coming soon. <laughs> but uh, but my whole point was is that usually people say, well, there's two sides to every story. Like it's a magic, like I said, like it's a magic spell. Now we're Freddy Krueger. Oh, there's two sides to every story. 
he was burned alive by people, so you know that wasn't right. He was also a pedophile child murderer in the movies. Yeah. So then burning him. So knowing his side of the story that he didn't get a fair trial isn't doesn't all of a sudden make it okay that he was a pedophile and a murderer. Yeah. The Boston Tea Party. All this property was damaged by these damn rebels. Yeah, they were protesting really unfair tax regime from a from a distant leader. You know, it's there are two sides, but I mean the other side doesn't necessarily affect it. But the people who bring it up almost always bring it up as though it dispels anything you've said. Mm-hmm. And that is what comes up a lot of the time with with people who will will see things like Nazis marching. They'll go, "Oh, well, you got to let them talk." You really don't. You really don't. Because they're not going to... Because, again, you let them talk and they get power, they'll take away your right to talk in a heartbeat. This crowd is loving it right now. They just did a... Just to, just to cut away from this conversation to something a little bit lighter than Nazis in the streets, uh, I do find it funny how many American and Canadian and European wrestlers go to... Have, oh, have, have over the years written in their books about how, oh, you go to Japan and it's hard to adjust because the crowd is so quiet and they're so polite. And then you see something like Big Van Vader in the Tokyo Dome and you see these salarymen in the crowd in their Bill Cosby sweaters losing their minds and you're like, the crowd isn't polite. You just have to work harder to engage them. <laughs> oh, no, you, you'd be surprised. And you'd be surprised the things that get them. There was a, when we did the, uh, the WWE tour over there. I, I still remember this. I was in the ring with one of the Usos because we had a four way tag match where it was us. The club, the Usos, and New Day. Mm. And obviously the club very adept to working in front of a Japanese crowd. I wouldn't have known that from the match. <laughs> <laughs> it was a four-way tag match. It's not like they're out there doing their Japanese spots. It yeah, was basically yeah, they were they were there, they you know, they were there doing their thing because that's what they were there to do. But it yeah, was yeah. it was kind of like, you know, you book Vader on a Japanese tour in WWE, he's probably still working like WWE Vader because that's what they're paying him to do. Yeah. Um, but what happened was at one point one of the Usos I don't even know what happened, but he was sitting on his butt, and I dove on him and snatched an armbar, and I heard the audience go, "Ooh!" and do the big, the the big, the big like shock thing because they were not expecting the white guy with the silly pose to snatch an armbar out of nowhere on someone. Yeah, and it was the reaction came because they genuinely appreciated that I pulled that out. You get, and again, you'll hear a lot of guys go, "Oh, they're really quiet." It's like, yeah, they're not going to get behind, punch, kick, stomp, grab a chin lock for ten minutes. That's not what they like. You got to give them something to sink their teeth in. If you watch, you know, Kawada versus Stan Hansen, same thing. They're yeah. losing their mind the whole time because they're they're going crazy. Yeah, you watch you watch Terry Funk in the late seventies in New Japan, the stuff that him and Dory were doing, and yeah. how much they had the crowd in the palm of their hand. Oh, yeah. And a lot of the time, wrestlers will. It's the weirdest thing. We have this real revisionist history with wrestling. A lot of uh, backwards uh, manufacturing of why things happened and how they happened, and a lot of you know revisionism of what actually even happened, but. The, the stuff with Japanese wrestling is they react to what they to, to a lot of different stuff because they really understand it. They understand um, combat sports in a way that most Americans don't, or at least didn't until the last maybe ten years. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, which is something that we've discussed on occasion uh, on the road for MLW, has been your your theory on duplicity, how it applies to professional wrestling, the sense of people learning from a copy of a copy. Well, if you go back to um, to wrestling when it first debuted on TV in the 1950s, everyone who was on TV was a territory wrestler or an old carnival wrestler who had been, you know, brought into the industry. So you had guys like, say, Gorgeous George or uh, Luthez or Stu Hart, all of whom were, you know, wrestler wrestlers, guys who had actual grappling backgrounds. They were either trained in catch privately yeah. or they wrestled in college and high school. Carl Gotch. Carl Gotch, yeah. I mean, he was an Olympian. Um, and from what I think the style was called Pawali. He was actually trained in an Indian style of catches catch can wrestling, uh, and he also trained at the Snake Pit in uh, Wigan, England. So you had all these guys coming in who were legitimate wrestlers, and wrestling wasn't so much worked at that point as fixed. You had a finish, and you just did the finish. You were told you knew, you know, you're beating me at you know 23 minutes, whatever, north of 25, whatever it is, with a with a crucifix pin. Okay, so we know whatever we're doing, don't you know, I'm not staying down for anything until I get that crucifix pin after 20 minutes, you know, after the, the ref says it's time to go home. Because of that, you had a generation of... Those guys were all brought up as wrestlers. They wrestled. But what winds up happening is in the 1950s, the first time wrestling's on TV, you have a generation of guys who are, you know, teenagers or adolescents who are watching wrestling for the first time. They're the ones that are going to be the next generation of wrestlers. So by the time we get into, say, the late 50s, early 60s, you have a generation of guys coming in who grew up watching wrestling for at least 10, 15 years. Then, 
those guys are wrestling now, and a lot of what they're doing is copying the guys they've already seen on TV. But it's you know it's like the first the first uh, generation of a Xerox or of a VHS tape, the first dub. You have fairly good quality because they're copying someone who did it well. But then we move on to another 10, 15 years down the road, the next generation of guys who now they grew up watching a generation of guys who grew up watching wrestlers. So they're a copy of a copy. And so on and so forth until we're, I think it's like six or seven generations deep now of guys who are watching 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 guys who are wrestlers. So you have wrestlers that are starting today that were inspired by Ricochet, who was inspired by Jeff Hardy, who was inspired by Shawn Michaels, who was inspired by, I don't know, Eduardo Carpentier, who. Oh, I I I mean, I think Shawn might actually even be young enough for it to have been uh, Flair. Because I know he said Flair's his favorite wrestler. And then Flair, who was inspired by Buddy Rogers, and mm-hmm. Buddy Rogers, who was, you know, a legit hooker. You get down six or seven generations, and it's an entirely different methodology yeah. at that point. Because the guys, and you'll still see some guys who have the lineage today, a guy like Norman Smiley, people don't understand, when he taught, or when he was taught pro wrestling, he learned from Carl Gotch and Boris Malenko. He was taught pro wrestling as a legitimate contest. Mm-hmm. Norman can do all the stuff for real. And the logic is, if you can do it for real, you never have to talk. If I can really take you down, I don't have to call a takedown. If I can really throw you, I don't need to tell you, hey, jump for me, brother. Um, with a lot of this stuff, we, we get guys are taught such a worked format that if you don't work with them, they really don't know what to do. Uh, mm-hmm. I was actually watching a match from Australia that a guy sent me. And the way I described it to him was it was the most as-seen-on-TV pro wrestling I'd ever seen. The guy he was wrestling, his opponent, who was the more experienced of the two... His, he did a belly to belly suplex that was so it was such a TV pro wrestling belly to belly suplex that it could have been out of a video game and not even like a recent video game like a, <laughs> like WWF uh, Warzone on PS One like that that's how bad it was well not not bad but that's how stock stock it was it was it was fascinating to see so you see a lot of stuff like that where guys are really just copying things they've seen and even then I I made the point that a lot of the I've, I saw out of the matches I've been watching, I've seen four separate matches that all had a finish involving the ref. Where, like, the ref is the star. Three of those matches were very literally, I'm going to argue with the ref, including one from Let's Wrestle up in Maine, uh, where the finish is, I'm going to argue with the ref an uncomfortably long time, turn around and take a finisher or get rolled up. And then one last one where it was, a guy went for a sunset flip, the heel grabbed the middle rope, the ref came over, kicked his hands off. A New Japan move, red shoes. Mm -hmm. And then roll up, finish. Yep. And I, my whole point was like, well, congratulations oh. out of the, you know, out of the finish, the big star is the ref. You're, you're yelling at the ref who you can't pin and who you can't beat and who isn't your opponent. You're, you're getting beat by the ref who isn't involved in the match as a competitor. So who gets over in the match? The ref. Not you. Not your opponent. No one. The ref. And the ref is the guy who, let's be real... Has got eight other matches out there tonight. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't need to get over with the audience. If anything, most people tell you the best refs are the ones you don't notice. Yeah, I mean it's the same with production. If 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 you can be invisible, you're doing your job. Mm-hmm. If you can't be invisible, you usually get fired day of. That I mean, was at WrestleMania in San Francisco. The, oh, the guy who walked in front of the camera and was literally fired up on the floor. I'm not. You can look this up. I don't. Even, it was. It was just like some production guy they hired for the day. Uh-huh. But he walked in front of one of the cameras and he literally got told through the mic, "Leave right now. You're fired." Whew. Like that, they, like Vince fired him on the spot. Apparently, like everyone could hear it through the through the headset. That'll happen. That'll yeah. that will happen. Because it's, they take it that serious, you know. Yeah. I mean, I was very fortunate that when I when I first got into doing the production side of professional wrestling, this would have been in 2010. So about I'm about a decade in now with that. And Miles I was. Buff. I <laughs> thank you. I was. I started out doing just camera work for Chaotic Wrestling up in Massachusetts, and one of the referees that worked for Chaotic at that time was Sean Bennett. And he would come up with the you know the, the Delaware Jersey car, uh, the guys that were working for Kettner. Mm-hmm. And he was the first person to explain to me the concept of working the U, where you know hard cam side is sacred zone. You do not touch that area. If you're going to be shooting stills, then you stand behind video. If you're going to be on video, then you get the corner. And obviously, you avoid blocking fans. And it's, you know, it's there's a very particular dance that you kind of have to do in front of a live audience, where you are trying to make sure that the crowd that's seeing everything on tape gets the best view they can, while you don't have some guy right behind you screaming, "Get the fuck out of the way! I paid twenty dollars for this seat!" And you have to try and make that dance happen where mm-hmm. both sides are happy. 
it's the same thing in, as, as referees and production. You know, it's you know we're we're all trying to make sure that as many people as possible can see you guys do your craft. Oh yeah, and they, there are a lot of guys that do a really good job. And the irony is, if they're doing a good job, you won't notice them. Mm-hmm. You, we've all at least once seen that ref who's just in the way. Yes, and it's the worst thing in the world. But the point is, overall. If you're calling your match and making your ref, but, but these guys are calling these finishes and making the ref the star because they've seen them on an old NWA tape, and it's like, oh well, you know, they they did it in the NWA, and Kurt Hennig and and Mr. and uh, and Rick Rude were you know great wrestlers, so it's a good finish. Like, well, one, it was a low level TV finish. Two, be clear, it was usually something along the lines of, oh, sorry, brother, I can't do a clean job here. It's you know, it's my hometown. I got a lot of got a lot of people that know me here. It's a bullshit reason they would do it. And on top of that, they were still working for an audience that was having it presented to them as being a legitimate competition. So they didn't really care what the finish was as long as the guy they liked won. Mm-hmm. And if the guy they didn't like won, well, now they're mad and they can't wait to see that guy get beat up next time. Yeah. So a lot of these things that fans just repeat and do because they've seen other or wrestlers repeat and do because they've seen other wrestlers do them and they don't actually consider the impact or the reasoning behind it. They just think it's right because yeah. it was done 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I... The one, t- the one thing that really bothered me uh, when, I ha- when I was in uh, Nick Dinsmore's class, he was going over cross bodies and he was saying, okay, you go this way if you want to get caught, and you go this way if you want to hit it. And I said, Nick, why don't you just go the same way, and if I want to catch you, I can catch you, and, or the same way both either time, and if I want to catch you, I can catch you, and if I don't, you know, I'll just take the bump. And he said, well, that's just how I was taught. And I remember thinking that is the most bullshit excuse you can ever give for why you do something, because that's what I was taught. Whenever I run seminars, I will implore the people, you've seen it, ask questions, question why I'm teaching you these things, question what I'm saying, question everything I'm telling you. Because if I don't have a reason, if I can't even reason it out when we're talking, then clearly it's not that good an idea. I think that was one of the reasons why, and you may have your own opinions about the guy, I think that was one of the reasons why for his first year or two in pro wrestling, Riddle got so much heat, was he was somebody who was very quick to question things that were just like, oh, standard pro wrestling, yeah, that's a part of the formula, where he would say, well, that just looks stupid, that makes me look stupid. I did not have any interaction with Riddle until he was probably three or four years in. I wrestled him one time in 2017. Okay. Like, right... It was one of, like, my third or fourth match out of WWE. Mm. So he was already on his way. Like, I think he was there the next summer. Yeah, I first shot him, I want to say, in, like, the fall of 2015. Well, because that was when he was doing stuff out of the Monster Factory, and, like, after he got his suspension from, from UFC. Yeah. But... It's an example of one of the things people don't like in wrestling is when you question things, but I I maintain that's the most important thing to do because you look at how much stuff makes no sense. I mean, I I damn near blew Christian Casanova's mind when I told him that none of this makes sense. (laughs) One of the the big poison in wrestling is that we've given out, in the last 30 years especially, we've given out so much information but so little understanding, so little context, that we have this large segment of the audience now, and unfortunately a large segment of the audience, that is more interested in trying to be right and feel like they somehow have more knowledge of this than the guys doing it, and then you know just want to enjoy wrestling. There are people that will you know fans will yell about the psychology of a spot or the storytelling in a match, and it's like hearing someone who no, who's never made a movie talking about cinematography. Ask them what cinematography is, and you'll get a lot of stuttering or stammering, like oh it's you know like the set right. And I because I made that point to you actually about lighting. I can't remember the, it was a similar context where I was talking about like I don't know anything about lighting. I know if I like the lighting in a movie, in a yeah. certain scenes, if the lighting is really pronounced, but I have no idea how to light something. You mm-hmm. do. And that was, the, that was the thing that happened. It was, a, it was Cicero. Like something oh, happened yes. with the lighting and you went, I know exactly what you mean now because the lighting got messed up yep. and it was driving you crazy. Yep. Yep. And I didn't notice the difference. But that's the thing. It's like, I'm, not a, I'm not a photographer. I'm not a, I don't film anything. I'm not a, a lighting guy. So I wouldn't know what, that, what was wrong. Yeah. I would know if it appealed to me or not. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people still frame it as it's good or bad, not it appeals to me or doesn't appeal to me. But they'll throw out words like psychology and make it seem like they know more what they're talking about. And I asked Christian, I said, what's psychology? And he was like, if things make sense or not, whether or not they make sense. Like, does any of this make sense? I mean, does anything we do in pro wrestling, really, like, if you really break it down? Does receiving an Irish whip make sense? Does... That's the one people go to, but let's think about literally anything. Does a, he- does a lockup make sense? You just go straight in for a punch. Yeah, well, exactly. It's like if you're not going to call me out for punching, or if, if there's no rules against punching, why wouldn't I just punch you right off the get-go? A lot of this stuff doesn't make sense. A lot of it is similar to theater in that regard that we we, we have, have this... unspoken like round book. Yeah, and it's one thing if you're actively doing going against that for a reason, 
But it's another thing to just follow it blindly and think that there's really a logic behind it, but there, there isn't. Even the basic story structure of Match is trying to tell someone that it's only there because wrestlers need a method to try and make an emotional bond with an audience that's not familiar with them. The whole concept of a shine, a heat, you know, double down, all this stuff, it's, it's only there so that if you're, you know, Joe Schmo from middle of nowhere and you're wrestling in front of a crowd for the first, and you're wrestling in front of a crowd for the first time that's never seen you, they need to know, oh, this guy's cool, he does cool things. Mm-hmm. Oh, this guy's mean, he does bad things. The white boots, black boots argument. Yeah. The wrestling audiences are not necessarily as evolved from a standpoint of fandom as we'd like to think. And a lot of the time they need that because they don't know any better. Now, if you're working on TV consistently or you've been on TV consistently, the audience might have a different reaction to you so you can actually go out there and do a lot of different stuff. But many people will make the mistake of trying to stick to that formula and that format even when they're over, even when the audience cares about them already. Like a guy like Warhorse or Dan Housen or Effie, people who are already familiar, if they're already familiar with the guy, Effie doesn't need to go out there and explain to you who Effie is at the beginning of his match. You either know who he is and care or you don't know who he is and in which case... Somebody near you is probably going to let you know what's up. The audience gets so caught up in these ideas that unfortunately we wind up cutting our own throat. We're now trying to please a guy who's more interested in making sure Vince Russo likes him on social media than we are trying to have a good match. I, I, I maintain for the life of me that good art is created when an artist is trying to express himself, not when they're trying to please people. Mm-hmm. If you ever hear a, a band or a song made by someone who's just trying to sell records, it's very obvious. And equally so, if you ever see a film that was very clearly made by a director who just knows that a studio is trying to hit their target for the quarter, mm-hmm. it comes off a lot differently than somebody who's been fine-tuning a script for the past ten years. Oh, yeah, dude. I was watching the uh, bonus features on Coco. Mm. You know, that movie took six years to make, and that's not just the actual animation. The animation's like two years out of the six. There's like four years of them refining the story, and the original story... His name's Marco. He takes the guitar to the land of the dead and he has to give it to De La Cruz to free his family from the curse. And his family in the afterlife is cursed to sing. They can't talk. They have to sing because he's done this. And uh, when he runs into Hector, Hector's a tour guide in the land of the dead. He's not just some homeless guy. Like, there's, even a, there's even a great joke where he, Miguel, because he's not paying, or well, Marco is not paying attention to the uh, tour. And later he's like, oh, come on, you can give me the tour while we go. He's oh, you can pay attention this time? Yeah, when's the next time I'm going to have a chance to see this place? You want to know that? <laughs> well, I mean, it's another thing, too. I don't know if you ever saw, there was this, this whole Pixar uh, like history of the company documentary, and one of the things they do is they show you the original footage for Toy Story. When the rough animation was done and the original voiceovers were done, where it had a way more, like like cocky smarmy cynical vibe to it where woody was a straight up asshole and it was a tape that they would bring home because it was like this is what i'm working on they'd show their families and their families would be like this sucks (laughs) well and again it's uh, it's a it's an art and the art the hard part with with cg animation is that you can't just change out of the drop of a hat it takes a while yeah so they have to make sure they have everything really set in before they start i don't know if you've ever heard about the original script for zootopia no they went real hard on the institutionalized racism metaphor like to the point of disturbing I could see it. They they made one. They I guess they made one animatic. It only exists as an animatic, where in this version, all carnivores at the age of like twelve, basically their bar mitzvah gift, get the shot collar. So there's this whole thing with this like little whatever he is. He's like a cougar or something, and it's his thirteenth birthday, and he's like all excited and he's looking around, and there's this weird somberness to the adults there because they know what's about to happen, and he doesn't yet. Mm. And they give him the shot collar, and he's like, what is this? He doesn't understand. He gets overly excited, and it zaps him, and you see the, like, it wash over his face what his life is yeah. and what the world thinks of him. And it's this very heavy-handed, brutal, just, hey, guys, this is what we do to minorities and people of color all the time. Basically tell them, if you raise your voice, you're going to get shot. And Disney went, no, 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 no. We, 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 we really can't do that. We'll get, we'll get a lot of heat. We're not risking that. And they made this... They, there's still elements of it in the script, but it's not nearly as harsh. No, as it's it more allegorical in the, in the final cut. It's, it's yeah. not so much of a, of a heavy hand. Yeah. But that was the idea, is that a lot of time stuff starts out and it changes really continually over the course of production. Yeah. I don't even know how we got there. 
I'm trying to think of how we got there. Oh, you know what it was? It was you you talking about lighting and how oh. and how you know wrestling, but you don't know lighting, and equally so. You know, I might I might be somebody who's been a, a close observer of the industry from you know the the cusp of it for the past decade, but I'm I'm not about to think that I can go and do eight to twelve TV time and make somebody look good. Oh no, and even then, sometimes understanding what is good about a match or why a match is good or what made it good is different than necessarily enjoying or not enjoying a match. A metaphor you see brought up a lot of time when audience members will talk about this is, I don't have to be a world-class chef to know if my food tastes like shit. Mm -hmm. Problem number one, your food may or may not taste like shit. Realistically, you just don't like it. We have to establish what your uh, actual, yeah, what your palate is. Yeah. Um, Have you ever seen Jiro Dreams of Sushi? Of course. There's a line he has in it where he's talking about, I think it's Wolfgang Puck, and because he's like uh, decreeing or decrying his whole, uh, his own palate. He's like, if I had a palate like him, who knows what I could make? He knows he doesn't have a palate as strong as Wolfgang Puck, so he doesn't taste with as fine a detail as he does. So even though he's this world-class sushi chef, he's looking at it going, yeah, I have good taste, but my taste can't even compare to his. So right off the bat, we need to establish, like, if, if you're, you know, your taste, if, you're, if your taste palate is McDonald's and great value, you know, pretzels from Walmart... Maybe I'm not going to take your opinion on whether or not a meal is good or not. I, you can tell me you don't like it. That's fine. Yeah, I can't argue if you don't subjective. like it. That's subjective. But the second you say it's sh- it tastes like shit, it's like, well, we have to establish your palate. Then we also have to go, okay, why is it shit? And this is where being a chef comes into play. A chef might eat that same meal, and regardless of what they say about it, they can tell you why. And this is why it matters. Because knowing if something sucks isn't as important as knowing why it sucks. Because nothing gets better if you just say I, that it sucks. That movie sucked. Why? Pacing of the story was off. Uh, the characters had no motivation. Several times you established things in the universe that immediately broke those rules. Mm-hmm. And you weren't going for a surrealist or uh, continually evolving whatever story idea. You were just writing poorly. A great example of that, a movie that I saw. I have the I have the uh, the movie pass deal, or the AMC like subscription thing. So like when I have a day off, then I'm just trying to kill time. I'll just go to the movies because I'm not paying any extra money to do it. Yeah. I went to go see Bloomhouse's Fantasy Island, uh, starring Michael Pena. Uh, top of the bill for once. I was actually happy to see that. He's been around for a hot minute. He is probably one of the most prolific actors going right now. Right. right. We consider that was a guy who like won an Oscar for you know he's Oscar nominated for like. Uh, God, it was something. It was like some some movie about cocaine, some movie about cocaine smuggling or whatever. Oh, was it Blow? It wasn't Blow. No, it wasn't Blow. It was something after Blow. Yeah. Uh, it was. I don't know. I can't Not remember. Cocaine Cowboys. No, no. It, no, it was something like Los Mongrels or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was yeah. One yeah. of those. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but uh, he he like, gets an Oscar nod for that. At the same time, he's in. Uh, he's playing the scummy security guard. In, Ant-Man. No, no, the scummy security guard in um, uh, Observing Report. Oh yeah. When he's talking like he's like. You know, you got it, you guys. We got Ricky. I'm a criminal. It's what I do. I commit crime. He's basically sound like Dusty. He's like, <laughs> that for some reason just reminded me of Patrice O'Neill in Arrested Development when it's like, did you did you burn down this the uh, the storage shed? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, uh, no, but uh, but I went and saw Fantasy Island, and it was just because I was like, I got two hours to kill before I go to the airport. Let me just let me just hang out in a dark movie theater and maybe fall asleep if it's if it's a boring movie. That was a movie that was so concerned with plot twists and changing your expectations that it completely forgot about making any of the characters empathetic. And that was really disappointing to me because I was like, I'm giving you my time. I am here to focus on your film. Please like, give me a hero. Give me a villain. And they tried, but they were concerned with Shades of Grey. They were concerned with, you know, like I said, subverting expectations. Mm-hmm. And it just felt like... They just couldn't stick to something long enough to make it work. Because, again, there, and there's a difference between what you just said and pointing out these actual things that they did and just going, oh, that movie sucked. And, and that's, to me, what it always comes down to is that you can have your opinion on wrestling. You can like it or dislike it. But the second you start saying that your opinion is 100% as valid as someone who's been doing it for 30 years and has experience in the industry and has done it at every level, and that doesn't mean they're right on everything. A lot of those guys mm-hmm. are wrong. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I can point out accurately why they're wrong, not just that they're wrong. On that same topic, though, let's talk quickly about, you know, within this conversation of if a match is good or not, everyone always likes to talk about the element of historical significance, when a match took place, what the scene was like at that moment. The argument has been made time and time again that 
Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 3 is realistically a terrible match, but equally an important match for the progression of the industry. Same has been said about Rock versus Hogan from, is that 18? Uh, it's 18. Yeah. 18. And it's, it's, it's this conversation of, you know, you're trying to, you're not trying to make an art piece that will, you know, stand for an audience 10 years from now. You're trying to make the best thing you can for the audience before you at that moment. Talk about, like, trying to thread that line. Like, knowing knowing the meat and potatoes that will allow something to still work later down the well, line. The issue is people need to understand what really sells a match is not necessarily the match as much as the promotion of the match. Mm-hmm. Hogan and Andre was beloved when it happened because they had done a very good job of basically conning the audience into believing a lot of stuff that wasn't true. And not, not the way that you normally would with a pro wrestling match. A lot of the marketing of the match had to do with this is a match that's never happened before. That's not that wasn't true. Andre's never wrestled for the world title. That wasn't true. Andre's never been body slammed. That wasn't true. Andre had been body slammed. Harley Race did it. Andre had been body slammed by Hogan on WWF TV in 1977 in less than a minute. <laughs> it was like the third move in the match. Hogan gives him two punches and body slams him. And then he goes over to Fred Blassie. Blassie gives him the gimmick to put in his elbow pad. He gives Andre the big clothesline, the... the I'm sorry, the Axe Bomber, uh, Andre Giggs, and that's the match. The match gets called. It's like a it's like a four minute match. It was a studio show, and it's actually on the Ultimate Hogan anthology that WWE put out in like 2003. Oh, the golden retriever mind of the 70s, 80s WWF fan. Well, well, it, it makes the whole point that that match really wouldn't work at any other period in time because you could Google these things, mm-hmm. and. If you put that match forward, you know, 30 years, it's not just about the quality of the, what's going on in the match. The promotion of the match wouldn't have worked. I mean, even something that uh, with WrestleMania 1, I didn't know this because, you know, I grew up in California. But I was, you know, three years old when WrestleMania 1. I was actually I was a little under two. Or a little over two because my birthday's in October. The promo they filmed with Hogan running around Venice Beach and they shot it like Rocky where all the kids are running with him. None of those kids knew who the fuck he was. <laughs> These were just paid extras. None of them knew who the fuck he was because wrestling wasn't big in Cal- or, you know WWE or WWF wasn't big in California at the time. That was that was BT it was big time territory, wasn't it? That was, uh, was well. Southern California was um, Gene LaBelle. Well, his mother ran Southern California. You also had AWA go down there sometimes, mm-hmm. but they mostly went to San Francisco. Yeah. But the point is, is that like WWE or WWF TV wasn't really big out there until it got on cable. So it'd still be a little while. That said, they presented WWF as already being popular. They presented pro wrestling as being this. That's why, that's why they bring in, you know, Liberace and Alice Cooper and all these other celebrities because they wanted the impression that wrestling was this hip, cool thing that celebrities watched. They were there for a payday. Yeah. But they conned the audience. But nowadays, you'd be able to Google, who the fuck is Hulk Hogan? And you would immediately know if this person was famous, quote unquote, or not. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've definitely had that, hey, y'all famous? I see a lot of people walk, wanting your autograph. Are y'all someone famous? No, nah, dude, we were fake TV wrestlers. We ain't famous. <laughs> <laughs> but that, it's something that happens. I, I am famous to a man at an airport at 6 a.m. in Providence, Rhode Island. That is who I am famous to. Exactly. I'm famous to that one TSA guy. <laughs> um, but have you ever had to bring a belt through like yes. the, the security? How much of a hassle is that? They always want to take it out and play with it. Fucking sucks. I yeah. It, it's the it. I let me put it this way. The, the, the premise you have in like 35% of adult, adult film scenes that are, is put forward, if someone just want, starts with someone just want to take it out and play with it, not nearly as entertaining when it's a pro wrestling belt and <laughs> it's preventing you from getting on a flight. Um, but again, with a, lot of, with a lot of the promotion of the matches, as like, there's, there's some people who look at it and go, it's about that one night. But you have to understand that any you know, wrestling, particularly at that large of a scale, it creates waves that go on forever. And the ones from that match, I, I maintain, did more damage to pro wrestling long term than good, because that cemented the image in most people's heads in the north in North America at least of what pro wrestling is: two lumbering giants, one who can literally not walk at the time because his back was so fucked up, slogging through a bunch of super hokey, phony looking punches and kicks, in front of a bunch of people who probably you know their blood type is incest, so. <laughs> Or they're just drunk as or fuck. Or just drunk as fuck. Because, I mean, it was, well, it was Detroit, yeah. That's not really an incest. It's, that's not Alabama. But uh, yeah, yeah. that's probably, you know. It was it was the crowd that would have been at, at, a, at a, like, Aussie. Just yeah. absolutely cocked at the Silver Dome. Mm-hmm. But the, the whole thing is, 
when you ask someone about pro wrestling who, who's never watched pro wrestling, the image they have in their head is Hogan Andre, and it's not a good image. It's never positive. And this can be said for a lot of uh, a lot of people as time goes on, is that they look at that and they go, oh, hey, that's wrestling. Well, no, Dynamite Kid and Tiger Mask is also wrestling. You know, Luthez and Carl Gotch against Sekiguchi and Anoki is also wrestling. There's a lot that goes on in pro wrestling. It's not this monolithic, you know, style of this one thing is pro wrestling. And it's always fascinating to me the matches that quote unquote non fans, which is it's it's a it's a stupid concept. The idea that there's like a whole subsect of people that believe in people that don't. When you show somebody who's not familiar with pro wrestling, I'm always fascinated by the matches or the moments that stick with them. My family doesn't watch pro wrestling. I didn't grow up watching wrestling because my dad or my mom or my sisters or whoever did. I started watching pro wrestling when I was like 12 years old because I was a latchkey kid that was just trying to entertain myself and I got to see like Matt Hardy and Shawn Michaels and these guys on TV and I was like, okay, this is rad. And I basically had to hide it because I knew that my family would make fun of me for watching wrestling. They didn't like WWE, but every once in a while I'd go to my dad's house he was a big Spike TV guy because he would watch like the, the you know car repair shows and he'd watch like CSI and all that. And there'd be like an Impact pay per view playing, and I'd just see like my dad and my sisters sitting down and watching an Ultimate X match between like LAX and America's Most Wanted or something, and they would just be like, "This is cool." And it was so perplexing, but at the same time, it was like, to them, that was what they wanted to see in pro wrestling. And so, yeah, the idea that there's a monolithic vision within, you know, people's mind of what pro wrestling is, is toxic. There are so many different styles and there are so many different formulas, and it's always for a different audience. So, you know, yeah, it's it's flavors of ice cream, it's it's genres of films, it's whatever it can be. You know, it's it's it doesn't have to be Hogan Andre. It doesn't, but unfortunately for most people, ever since that match happened, or they think wrestling's all Steve Austin, a guy flipping the bird and swearing and yeah. punch, kick, stomp, and does a stunner. Or it's The Rock, a guy who's... I, I've, I've met The Rock one time. He was perfectly polite. I have nothing bad to say about him, but his promos, if you go back and watch him, are literally, he says a catchphrase, he implies his opponent's gay, and that's a bad thing because it's 1997 and mm-hmm. being gay is apparently the worst thing you can be on TV. He says another catchphrase and that's it. That's all he does. And it's it's almost laughable that we've talked about this guy as always the, always the greatest promo man of all time. He really isn't. The reality is most promos even are so of the moment mm-hmm. that it's funny to me that people will talk about anyone being a great promo because it's a commercial. It is. It's meant to sell a single match or get over a gimmick. A gimmick is always going to be short term. And a single match you move on from. Even the whole style that we teach people, you have to, you know, that you they want you to learn. You know, cut a promo, one minute, go. You're wrestling this guy, this city. That came from the old TV promo style of, hey guys, we're doing 300 shows this year, and also we have regionalized television. This commercial is going to air in front of two markets. Yeah. So, so we- hey guys, catch us in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then all right, do it again from Boston. Yeah. And that's so. This whole style that is developed is based on something that most people will never do. Mm-hmm. We've ne- I've never had to do thirty different promos for thirty different cities ever. We've th- we've even done a plain form promo. I know I remember this for house shows yeah. that was to air before certain matches. Yeah, and they'd do it for you know two, three, four weeks, whatever, on a loop. It was that sort of thing where we have a lot of misconceptions about what we're supposed to be learning. So we're learning skill sets that we don't even use, and we're using those as the standard for what's good and bad. And again, people say people have, like the audience has internalized this message of oh, it's all about the promo. It was all about the promo for the guys who are getting paid off the gate because the logic was if they can convince more people to show up, they'll they get more money, money at the end of the day. Yeah. This is even more laughable when you realize that the whole concept of being getting paid off the gate was a con. It was promoters shifting the cost of a show from themselves to the talent. Because if the house was light, they could blame the talent and it would come out of the talent's money. Mm-hmm. So instead of the promoter, who their job is to promote, it's why I love Anthony Green. <laughs> no no joke. When Anthony did his first show uh, up in... Uh, I don't Gar- know, Gardner, Massachusetts. Gardner, Massachusetts. Thank Zero you. Zero-one USA Northeast. Yes, the longest name for any prom- promotion ever. When he did his first show, he legitimately, because um, Evie, she lives there, or she's from there, so he, like that's where his girlfriend lives. They would... He, was there every day promoting the show. Because to me, I, I've told people before, promoting is the hardest part of wrestling. 
but the problem is so many promoters are so lazy that they're they'll oh I'll put a post on Twitter. Oh, I'll uh, put I'll, I'll start a Facebook event. Yeah. I'll get a group chat and then have everybody who's on the show do three posts a day about the show. Yeah. That doesn't get you fans. You have to be pounding pavement and putting flyers out there in people's hands and making sure they know the events happening, hooking up with, you know, community groups in the in the area that are going to promote the show themselves. I mean, if you hook up with like a church group or a whatever local chapter of the Special Olympics, They'll sometimes buy, you know, a hundred tickets just to give to their followers and their their you know, their people. Yeah, Chaotic would do that with Boy Scouts. They yeah. had a local Boy Scouts chapter that would buy out a block of tickets. Because and also because they pitched it as a family friendly show. Exactly. But a lot of the time promoters don't really put that effort in. So the whole idea would be if the promoter fails to do their job, rather than them losing money because they're having to pay everyone for doing their job, they don't have to pay these guys. Because they didn't do. Imagine working at McDonald's and a guy going showing up and being like, "I mean, yeah, you were at the grill eight hours today, but we just didn't sell enough burgers, man. You really should have been pushing those burgers harder. Sorry, I can't pay you." The pro wrestling mentality. Because I started working in wrestling when I was like seventeen, it really did mess with me when I started working in jobs in traditional businesses. Because I would have that mentality if I was in a showroom, even if I wasn't on a commission job. But I think to myself, "Shit, man, we didn't sell any cameras today. Like, I wonder if the boss is going to come after me." And I would talk to a manager, and they'd be like. No, it's not on you. I I had that struggle when I worked at a uh, a gym where doing memberships because you had people that would be, they'd had that mentality of you got to push the memberships. Look, someone coming in here, they either want they just want to know the price. Ninety nine percent of the time, if a person decides whether or not they're going to sign up at a gym, two things factor in: the amenities and the cost. That's it. That's it. That's all that matters to them. They're not. There's no amount of you know shucking and jiving. No no hoopla you can throw their way. That's going to make them go, oh, hey, this is really a great idea. But you have a lot of these these guys have this mentality. I mean, I remember I was scheduled for an eight-hour shift. My shift was coming to an end. I went to my manager and said, hey, um, shift's coming to an end. Do you want me to clock out? And he goes, well, it depends. I, do you not want to make any more money? And I went, okay, I'll clock out. Fuck you. You want me to stay? Tell me to stay. Yeah. I got no problem staying. I got nowhere to be. You've but, seen this tag match before, right? Uh, is this against uh, Ogawa and, and Izuka? Oh, yeah. Yes, brutal. the one the one where it, it, it gets stopped on a shoot midway through, and Inoki an o- an comes into the ring and loses his mind and restarts the match. Oh yeah, that's no, this is uh, the the New Japan January fourth two thousand Tokyo Dome show because this is right before Hashimoto left, isn't it? Yes, this is the height of Inokiism. This is the height of when Anoki was booking shooters and, like, Ogawa was the scariest man on the fucking planet. Which is hilarious because he was, uh, his, his reputation in judo was being a coward. Not they, in pro wrestling. They, 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 they played it up, bit, like, they, 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 that was where the whole chicken gimmick came from in, uh, in Hustle. Yeah. Was it came from in judo, he was, he was basically a guy, he would be on defense the whole time. And he'd keep on defense until you got so frustrated you fuck up, and then he'd get like a point, and that was his deal. Izuka is such a good second gun for him in this match too, because Izuka has such an aggressive face, and all of the battering that he does in the first half of this match just makes you want to see Hashimoto and Ogawa go at it even oh, yeah. more. No, I like I for as much as people talk about how the shoot style era of New Japan was like a death knell for like that era of pro wrestling in Japan. I I, there, I disagree. I think it was ahead of its time, if anything. I, yeah. I, I think the real issue was no one knew how to deal with it when it came on. Well, how do you how do you think about the presentation of a product like UWFI as compared to when it was adapted by like UFO or New Japan? Well, I think the, the deal was consistency. I'm a big believer that continuity is your most important tool in anything. It's, we've talked about this before. It's why I love Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Because when something happens in Always Sunny, it stays with the show. Every it just t- progressively gets worse. Oh, yeah. They, they never... Even when there have been episodes where, the, where they get arrested, and they'll reference getting arrested in the beginning of the next episode. Mm-hmm. And about how, you know, why that they got off because of a technicality. Or like, they actually have a reason. They don't just ignore it and move on. Uh, they don't. They don't pull the uh, what is it? The the honeymooners where Ralph loses his job in one episode and he never gets the job back. And the next episode he has his job back. And they never explain it. Yeah. But I think uh, continuity is the real issue. UWFI, all their shows were top to bottom work shoots. Yes. It's hard to do a work shoot when on some shows when you know you have the juniors out there, you have uh, you have the luchadors, you have the uh, more traditional pro wrestling matches. It, it's kind of a hard 
it's a hard left to take. Well, that's I think that was one of the reasons why early days FMW is so bizarre because they tried to do that. They were like, oh, we'll get the Michinoku Pro Luchadors and then we'll have a boxer versus a judo guy. Uh, Leon Speaks versus uh, versus an. Uh, Onita in the cage is the best match ever. I, if I could, if I could watch one pro wrestling match for the rest of my life, that would be it because it's such a ridiculously terrible idea on every level. Oh, that you have to love it. Oh yeah, yeah. Azuka, God, he's great. He's just a who, monster. Who is who is Hashimoto's second in this? Um, oh, that's no, that's uh, I think that's Ishizuki. I might be mistaken. Um, he's the guy. He's actually in a uh, Suzuki Gun now. The ball guy. Oh, that, that, that's him. Shit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but I. And this, we have the volume off on this so that we can just talk, but this is one of the loudest I've ever heard the Tokyo Dome for this match. It is unreal crowd volume for this now, match. I maintain, if you want to hear a great one, you got it's a Shibata and Akiyama from 05. Oh, Big Mouth Loud. Oh, no, no, they're, they're Wrestle 1 match. Oh! Their Big Mouth Loud match is great because that's the one where... Uh, There's like blood within like 30 seconds. Oh, that, no, that's, that's Wrestle 1. Oh, okay, I'm um, thinking of the Wrestle 1 match. I mix up the, the two. The Big Mouth Loud match is the one where he comes out uh, Shibata does, and his hands are covered. And he gets in the ring, he's got the gloves on. And he immediately rushes uh, um, Akiyama and starts punching him, punching him, punching him. And finally, when the ref backs him up, he rips the gloves off and goes in bare fist and starts punching the shit out of him. <sighs> and it's one of those things where it's such a simple trick. Because normally he wouldn't have the gloves on. Yeah. <laughs> but by wearing the gloves and taking the gloves off, he's now revealed the fist as opposed to it's, just... It's, it's the whole pulling the elbow pad off effect. Yeah. Exactly. But it'd be like pulling the elbow pad off if you never wrestled with an elbow pad. Yeah, <laughs> it would be like if you wrestled every it's, match with it. It's it's why I love Mansur's whole knee pad up, knee pad down. It's, it's the best. It's just it's straight up making fun of the whole you know Jerry Lawler, Kurt Angle. Like oh now he means business. Oh well, Jason Jordan did that a couple of times where he pulled the straps down and get cut off in the middle of his heat, and then or he get cut off in the middle of the comeback, and then it would be time for him to do the comeback, and he put the straps. On I so think I remember that. Again. I think I remember that, man. Because we. We started. I, I when I interned with NXT, I think we started within like three months of each other. We did because the first time I met you was at one of the uh, Largo. The no, no, it was uh, no, it may have been at Largo, but the first time we talked was in Tampa mm. at, the, at the FCW building. Yep, because that was when you told me that you'd worked for Chaotic and stuff. Yeah, no, because we met in Largo because that was when Mercedes was giving me back like a Bola DVD that she had borrowed All from right. me, and so we started talking because obviously Ryan Drago or oh yeah, yeah, I, you I, know. I, but, I want to, I'm, I hold the record. First match ever in PWG history. <laughs> no one can take that away. You can take a lot away from me in my career, but not that. I have the first PWG match ever. Yep. But no, yeah, we, yeah, so we, we met right around that time. And that was also, man, some of those houses for those early NXT house shows. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of what building it was. It might have been Bartow. Stark is the worst one. Was was Stark the one during the government shutdown where it was like a it was like a National Guard armory? And yeah, that was the in... it's the one by the uh, where they execute people. Yeah, um, but it was the one that was always really bad. It, where I think one time Sam Udell, uh, Dak Draper in uh, Ring of Honor, mm-hmm. um, his dad was the entire side of the ring. Like his dad was the only person sitting on one side of the ring. Oh boy! I think it was there were like there were sometimes houses there of like fourteen people. That was where Bray Wyatt got into a fight with. Uh, what was his name? The guy that won um, Tough Enough? Not and, Daniel Pewter. No, and Andy something, like the Silent Rage. Oh, him. That guy. He was like he was like Dan Spivey's nephew. Yeah. Something like that. But uh, Didn't he end up with some kind of like a substance issue? Oh, yeah. Or, yeah. I guess, and Bray, you know, he was an amateur wrestler, so he did not, he, he took him down pretty good. <laughs> like, he got, Andy, got, Andy got mad at him, and Bray wound up taking him down. It's oh. like, you, are we done? Are we like, oh, boy. It's one of those. Yeah, man. Back in the day, you you were really pushing up the strongman carnival gimmick at that. That's what time. they were paying me to do. Yeah, yeah. Did didn't you have like the worked weight? I did have the worked weight. That was, and we never got to use it for anything. <laughs> we literally we used it for a couple matches when me and Bull were tagging. We came out with it, but we never used it for. It was one of those deals where I was like, and I was the one making this shit because it was like I would do it for promo videos. Uh, before yeah, because you guys had the whole promo classes yeah. too, and but it was all this stuff where I'd. Like when I did the puppets with uh, the Ascension, when me and we didn't go through the puppets with the Ascension, they didn't uh, use any of it. <laughs> no, it, it's that weird idea of, of if I really go back, if I ever think about WWE, the biggest, the most letdown, like the one thing that really lets me down is the real the realization that we had all this great stuff that they just didn't use. It wasn't even like they didn't like it. It wasn't like they were bothered by it or hated it or thought it was terrible. They just didn't use it. Yeah, because I mean, for a company of that size. A, 
outside of their direct like three stories that they're fully dedicated to a lot of it is treated like archive and gather so it's like oh this is great for us to use later it's a similar thing of in the times when i've been able to be present for you know tryouts or something of that sort you know and you get to see the gears turn in a coach's head where they think to themselves we don't have someone like you we'd like to have someone like you it's this mentality of yes this is good to have later and it's a storage mindset well you know what they originally signed me for right which, which was that i was gonna be put with sanda ah that was your they we'd uh they they liked my look and everything when they saw me do the tryout and they immediately called me in uh, after we were done they put me in the promo room with him mm. so i did like five minutes of promos by myself um, and then uh, he came in, and we did another couple, f- uh, another like five minutes of just like improv with me and him. I think the original idea was to put me with him, and that was in Ju- I think that was in July. Mm. I didn't even start with the company until July of the next year. Mm. Aaron Stevens, yep. o- OG chaotic guy. Oh yeah, and Ma- now with uh, NWA. Oh yes, and he's doing a Karate Man gimmick. I guess it's wearing funny. nude colored tights, which look wonderful on him. They never look good on anyone. You. <laughs> If we learn nothing from the Johnsons in fucking oh, early boy. TNA, the Shane twins dressed like a couple of dicks, which is different than how they normally looked. I don't know how, but uh, but they but no, that was yeah. The Ding Dongs, they they were just like flesh tone bodysuits. No, no, they weren't flesh. No, gold. They, they were they were like purple and gold because they, uh, they, yeah, they were meant to be bells. Yes. Whereas the the Johnsons were literally meant to be dicks. Did human dicks. What was were the I'm, I'm, I mix up the Johnsons and the Bashams. The Johnsons were the the Gemini. That's right. The, uh, the Gemini. The, Sh- the Shane twins. The Gemini. And then you had uh, the Bashams were uh, Doug Basham and Danny Basham. Uh, no, it was because uh, was it Dan? Was one of them was the Damager? Damager. Yes. Well, because well, no, I thought that's how it was pronounced for years, but it's the Damager. The Damager. Because the way it, it was looks des- like Damaja. I know, but it was meant to be the. It, how can I put this? The way it was described was a. More urban version of Steve Austin. The damager. Yeah. I'm afraid to leave the house. I'm as timid as a 